Welcome to the Bold and Determined Podcast with your man Victor Pride. And right here on the Podcast for Winners, we're bringing you motivation and mindset for the killers and real dealers, the makers and the takers, the winners and the grinners, and goddamn, even the sinners too. Let's get started. Well, hello, my friendly friends. Welcome back to another edition of the Bold and Determined Podcast with your man, Victor Pride. What do you say we get started on today's episode of the podcast, my friendly friends? In the last episode of the Bold and Determined Podcast, we had a question from Rohan who asks, Hi, Victor, what is your take on mental illness? Back in the day, people with mental illness were thought to be possessed by demons or evil spirits. In this day and age, there are psychiatric drugs to suppress symptoms of different mental illnesses. Do you think there is a logical way to handle these mental illnesses and cure them? Do you think psychiatric drugs act like every other drugs, meaning they suppress the symptoms for a little bit, then when the drug wears off, the symptoms come back even stronger and the person is caught in the loop of taking drugs? That's a great question. And I have a lot to say about this topic. I'll answer your last question first. People who take psychiatric drugs, they suppress the symptoms for a little bit. Then when they get off their meds, what happens? They go even crazier. So is there a better solution for curing mental illness? And can mental illness be cured? In my opinion, yes, it can be cured. You see, I believe mental illness is just like physical illness. In fact, they are nearly one and the same. If you have a physical illness, you will also have a mental illness. And if you have a mental illness, you will also have a physical illness. There is not that big of a difference between the mind and the body. And if you don't treat your body right, you can expect to develop a mental illness. Specifically, if you don't eat the right foods and if you do eat the wrong foods, you can expect to develop vitamin deficiencies. And without the right vitamins in your blood, you will not be well. And my view of mental illness is different than most people. I believe it can be cured and quite easily, but I'm not so sure that it will be cured. And this is a great big topic, so I'll try and explain to you exactly what I mean. I believe that most people in the United States of America are crazy. And it would seem that the psychiatric industry agrees with me because at least one in six Americans are taking psychi- are taking psychiatric mental drugs for their mental illness. So it is not only my opinion that Americans are in fact crazy, it is the opinion of the psychiatric industry as well. So when I come to America, I get to live firsthand in a crazy world and I get to see how crazy people act. And One thing that crazy people do, symptom that crazy people have is the symptom of cognitive dissonance. They don't understand reality. They say the opposite of reality. And deep down, everybody knows what reality is. But they've been so, let's just call it brainwashed. They've been so brainwashed to believe in non-realities such as men and women are equal and the same and men and women can do exactly the same things. This creates cognitive dissonance in the mind of the average American or average Western person. It drives them to insanity. And I see it every single day. These people are out of their darn minds. They're just nuts. They're crazy. And then I look at what they eat. I watch them at the supermarket. When they say they eat broccoli, they actually eat a bag of frozen broccoli. They eat food from a can or food from a bag. They don't eat any real natural food. They go buy their food at fast food restaurants like In-N-Out Burger and Burger King and Taco Bell. They're not getting any vitamins in their nutrition. They're not eating foods that are high in vitamins. They're not getting the nutrition they need, so it's no wonder that they're insane. And then on top of that, what do we have? We have the news media feeding them absolute lies at all times of the day and night. If you've never been to America, it will shock you how much the news plays a part in the life of the average American. It is absolutely nonstop here. The propaganda is absolutely nonstop and it's telling them all the time, men and women are, men and women are the same. Uh, it's okay to be a tranny. It's okay to be a butt fucking gay person. All these things are good. It's bad to be, here's what's bad. It's bad to be a straight man with a family. That's bad. It's good to be a butt fucker. Yeah. So you have a land of insanity and everything in this land is designed to make these people insane. Let me tell you the parable of the poisoned well. This parable will show you exactly what reality is like for sane people in America. 
There was once a wise king who ruled over a vast city. He was feared for his might and loved for his wisdom. Now in the heart of the city there was a well whose waters were pure and crystalline from which the king and all of the inhabitants drank. When all were asleep, an enemy entered the city and poured seven drops of a strange liquid into the well. And he said that henceforth all who drank this water shall become mad. All the people drank of the water, but not the king. And the people began to say, The king is mad and has lost his reason. Look how strangely he behaves. We cannot be ruled by a madman, so he must be dethroned. The king grew very fearful, for his subjects were preparing to rise against him. So one evening he ordered a golden goblet to be filled from the well, and he drank deeply. The next day there was great rejoicing among the people, for their beloved king had finally regained his reason. This story, this parable of the poisoned well, describes people who live in America and eventually give in to the insanity they see around them because everybody around you, when you're in this land, is telling you insane things. And you start to think, wait a second, am I the crazy one? How come I'm the only one that could look up in the sky and see chemtrails? And when I point them out to other people, they say, oh no, th there's nothing in the sky. Those aren't chemtrails. You think, just look, look at the sky. It's right there. Just look. They say, no, chemtrails are not real. You're crazy. When I lived in Asia for eight years, I didn't think chemtrails were real because I never saw them. I thought people who thought, who believed in chemtrails were crazy. And then I came back and you know what? Every morning at five o'clock in the morning, I would see planes in the sky leaving chemtrails everywhere. You could see them everywhere. And then when I point them out to people, they don't notice them. They don't see them. Because they're in the thick of it, they see it every day, they don't notice it. Because I was away for a long time and came back, I can see these jagged lines in the sky that are not natural. And in fact, we've even had reports that they have sprayed lithium in the sky in the form of chemtrails. So who knows what chemtrails actually are? That's not the point. I don't know what's in chemtrails. I just know I can look up in the sky and those trails in the sky are not natural. So I don't know what they are. I don't know what they do. I just know they're right there and all you have to do is look up and you can see them. And when I tell other people, look at those chemtrails, they say, what chemtrails? The chemtrails right in front of your fucking face right there. They're right there, but they don't notice them. I took a picture of the chemtrails this morning. And I tell you what, I will post the picture in this article so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. I was out in the coffee shop this morning, 7 a.m., taking pictures of the chemtrail and I walked into the coffee shop. And the nice lady behind the counter said, what are you taking pictures of? And I said, oh, of the trails in the sky. She looked and she said, yeah, it's beautiful, isn't it? I said, uh, yeah, that's why I was taking pictures. Now where I'm staying is quite beautiful. There's a mountain in the background where there are no chemtrails in the sky. It is very gorgeous. So I can understand that, yes, one would think that it is gorgeous to take pictures of the sky, but this morning it was not gorgeous. There are nasty, jagged chemtrails in the sky all morning, which I took pictures of so I could show you. She said, what are you taking pictures of? I said, the trails in the sky. She said, it's beautiful, isn't it? No, it's not beautiful. That's why I'm taking pictures of it. Of course, I didn't say anything to her. I've learned my lesson. I've learned my lesson. Keep your mouth shut. Unless you're talking to somebody who knows. And friend, it's just you and I that know. And perhaps some of you still don't believe that chemtrails are real. Well, I tell you what. I tell you what. Look at the pictures. And if you don't think chemtrails are real, I got nothing else to say to you. I just don't. I can't waste my time trying to tell you that chemtrails are real when all you got to do is look at the fucking picture. Look in the sky and there you will see chemtrails. Again, I don't know what are in chemtrails. I'm not an expert on this. I don't know what they do. I just know that they're not natural. So regarding craziness, let's get back to that. Most people today are crazy. And I believe we can thank the agricultural revolution for this. Because the food that most people eat today is not natural. When you go to the supermarket and you buy your broccoli, when you buy your oranges, when you buy your bananas, when you buy your rice, when you buy your bread, you're buying foods that are man-made. You're buying foods that have never existed in nature. All these foods did not exist before 10,000 years ago. So all of us are eating foods that are completely unnatural to the human body. These foods have various consequences on our physical health and our mental health. Before 10,000 years ago, people didn't get cancer. They didn't get diabetes. They didn't get heart disease. 
None of these things happen. And remember when I said that you cannot be physically well, that you cannot be physically sick and mentally well. They go hand in hand. When you are physically sick, you are also mentally ill for sure. So if you are eating the bad food, you have no idea what it's doing to your body. And you can't know. The only way you can know what these foods are doing to your body is when you take a break from these foods. And there are only two ways to take a break from these nasty foods. Go on a fast or eat a carnivore diet with zero carbohydrate intake. And your mind will simply open up and you will understand, oh my goodness gracious, all this time I've been eating unnatural food that has been poisoning my mind and my body. But when you try to explain that to these people who are still eating these foods, they don't understand because it's not possible for them for them to understand. The only way that it is possible to understand what these foods are doing to you is to take time away from these foods. So when you talk to people about the correct diet, you're talking to crazy people. You're talking to insane people. So how the hell do you get insane people to listen? Me? I no longer care if they listen. I have reached the fifth stage, which is acceptance. I just accept that people are crazy and I don't care anymore. I'll tell you if you ask me, but if you don't ask me, I don't give a good goddamn anymore. I just don't care. I have written all the articles. I have given you my story over and over. If you can't accept that, there's nothing else I have to say to you. If you can't look at the sky and see the jagged lines in the sky that are not natural, there's nothing else I have to say to you. Now that's your everyday level of crazy people, which is your, it has become normal. I don't even meet people who aren't crazy anymore, unless they come from the blog, unless they come from B&D. When I had the B&D barbecue, it was great because I met so many people who weren't crazy. I met so many great people who had their heads screwed on straight. But in your average everyday life, especially in the middle of America, you meet crazy people every day. So just live with it. But then you have people who are really crazy, the people who are sitting in a bush in traffic talking to themselves. Those people, I think, have, I think what happened to those people is that they were so nice, they never took up for themselves until one day they just snapped and started having conversations with themselves. Or another great big contributor to mental illness is drugs. Of course, drugs, specifically marijuana cocaine, amphetamine, all of these drugs make you crazy. So if you are habitually taking these drugs, you are making yourself mentally ill. You are making yourself crazy. If you are taking psychiatric drugs, you're also making yourself crazy. And it's really as simple as that. Because the natural human state, if you eat natural clean food, and if you don't take any drugs, and if you don't believe the lies that tell you on the television, you're going to be sane. It's as simple as that. But if you're poisoning yourself with the bad food, all the carbohydrate foods today act like drugs, and you'll never understand that until you get off of them. So I get these idiot people telling me how carbohydrates make them feel good and happy and strong, and it's a joke to me. Here's what it's like in America with these people. It's like everybody in America has a blindfold on their eyes, and then one day you understand that you have a blindfold on, and you take it off, and then you can see. And you see these idiots stumbling around, bumping into things, not understanding things. And you say, hey, bro, hey, man, if you, you've got a blindfold on, if you take it off, you'll be able to see things better. And they say, I can see everything you can see. I can see everything just fine. I'm not even wearing a blindfold. Okay, man, sure you're not. That's what it's like living in America. It's like living with people who are wearing a blindfold and refuse to accept the fact that they are wearing a blindfold. That's what I see when carbohydrate eaters tell me they feel good eating carbs. No, you don't. You just don't understand it. You don't have a clue. You don't have a clue what it's like until you actually experience it for yourself. You don't know how fucking crazy you are. You don't know how sick you are until you're not sick anymore. You have no idea what true health is until you're healthy. What you think of as healthy is sick. And you're not going to notice that until you become well. And most of these people are not going to become well. Any mentally ill person can become well, but it doesn't mean they're going to. It takes self-responsibility to become well. And most people don't have that. They just don't. Most people give responsibility for the health to other people. They give their responsibility for the health to doctors, hospitals, governments, scientists, food companies, instead of taking responsibility for their own health. And uh, that's never going to produce anything other than ill people. And if you have an ill body, you have an ill mind. That is called mental illness. So what are my thoughts on mental illness? Eat the right food, don't take drugs, and uh, look around you and notice things around you. And it's very easy to be sane. Again, you have these people who are actually crazy, 
running around talking to themselves, talking gibberish, things like this. Again, these people refuse to accept the fact that they're crazy as well. So it's a, it's a, a refusal of responsibility. There's a fella who's been emailing me darn near nonstop who's insane. I think he can be well again, but he's insane. Let me look through my email and see if I can find this fella. Okay, here's one email he sent to me. Here's the subject line. Trump is not my cult leader. Here's his message. Trump is the snake. God. That's an email from a crazy person. Okay? If you're in this business, you will periodically get emails from crazy people. A lot of times they're on drugs. A lot of times they're on cocaine, Adderall, reefer, even alcohol. And so when you get off that stuff, you, you get well again. But then you get people like this who are just, who knows if this person is on drugs or not. And I, I responded back to this person because he has left multiple emails and multiple comments. Here's what I said to him. I said, you need help. You have severe mental problems. You seem to be living in a delusion. You aren't living in the real world. When people tell you that you are crazy, you need to listen to them. They are telling you the truth. If you're on drugs, pills, or alcohol, get off them. And then he responded this. He said, I would like to see you call me crazy after you get MK Ultrad. This is very disrespectful, Victor. I thought you would have more respect for your fans. How the fuck do you know that I was not MK Ultrad? Ever been MK Ultrad, one of your former fans? Okay, let's let's assume that is true. Let's assume you were MK Ultrad. You still have mental problems and you have to deal with them. And this is what I mean by crazy people not taking responsibility. They refuse to accept reality. And listen to that word, they refuse to accept reality. Just because people tell you you're crazy doesn't mean that you actually are. Because people will tell you you're crazy if you say, hey, look at those chemtrails right there in the sky. And then a hundred crazy people will say, there are no chemtrails in there, you're crazy. But when people such as myself, who don't give a fuck about your feelings, tell you that you need help, you need to listen. You really need to listen. So that's enough about mental illness. I don't want to rant about that anymore. Let's get into the next question. Sean asks, Victor, what is a question you will not answer? Ooh, boy, I tell you what, I've been on red growth now for about three weeks, and it's so darn strong, I don't want to answer any question. I have absolutely no more patience at all because my testosterone is through the friggin' roof. On red growth, every question annoys me, and uh, it has become difficult to even want to record the podcast, so I'm going to have to get off of red growth. It is too strong. It is too strong for me to do my work effectively because I like to sit down and explain things to you in a calm and positive manner. But on red growth, I just want to rip your fucking head off. So that's the question we'll not answer all of them. As long as I'm on red growth, I don't want to answer any question at all whatsoever. I've got no patience, especially for dumb questions. So I'm going to have to finish out this month and then take a break from this stuff. It's too strong. So strong that I've been working out two hours a day. I've been doing at minimum 600 push-ups a day. It's been nuts. Brad asks, what is your opinion on the mouse utopia experiment? Well, I'm not sure that I have a real great big opinion on it. it. The mouse utopia experiment shows us what life is like in the inner city, especially when you're on welfare or in a communist state. So let me give you a little bit of background on the mouse utopia experiment. In 1972, there was an animal behaviorist who built a mouse paradise filled with beautiful buildings for a rat, so I don't think that matters, and limitless food. At first, he introduced eight mice into the population. This was called Universe 25. It was a giant box designed to be a rodent utopia. He divided this box into main squares and then subdivided into levels with ramps going up to apartments. So they lived in basically an apartment building like you would see in the Soviet Union or China. The place looked great, but that doesn't matter. It's for rats. And it was always stocked with food. So you've got your welfare there. So these rats lived and they didn't have to work to find their food. It started off with four males and four females. And in a year and a half, almost two years, the population reached 2,200. And then after that, the population of the rats declined to unrecoverable extinction. At the peak population, most mice spent every living second in the company of hundreds of other mice. They gathered in the main squares, waiting to be fed and occasionally attacking each other. Very few females carried pregnancies to term. And the ones that did have babies forgot about their babies. They'd move half their litter away from danger and they'd forget about the rest of them. Sometimes they'd drop and abandon a baby while they were carrying it. The few secluded spaces had a population they called the beautiful ones. These were guarded by one male, and the beautiful ones were a bunch of females and a few males 
who uh, inside the space, they didn't breed, they didn't fly, they didn't do anything but eat, groom, and sleep. When the population started declining, the beautiful ones were spared from violence and death, but had completely lost touch with social behaviors, including having sex or caring about their young. The common space in this utopia is where the animals, they would crowd together in the greatest number. And as many as 60 of the 80 rats in each population would assemble in one pen during periods of feeding. Individual rats would rarely eat except in the company of other rats. As a result, extreme population densities developed in the pen. As a result, extreme population densities developed in the pen adopted for eating, leaving the other areas with sparse populations. So this is your city versus the very sparse populations and towns in the countryside. Many female rats were unable to carry pregnancy to full term. Among the males in the group, the behavior disturbances range from sexual deviation to cannibalism and from frenetic overactivity to a pathological withdrawal from which individuals would emerge only to eat, drink, and move about only when other members of the community were asleep. So we see female rats basically having abortions or not caring about their litter. We see the male rats becoming sexual, sexual deviants and even cannibals and not emerging from their little apartments unless everybody else was gone. So we see what happens when rats or mice live in huge population densities. And we can uh, extrapolate this to humans because mice and humans share some similar characteristics. So this is what we see in modern cities today. We see women not caring about their babies, not raising their babies. We see the beautiful ones. Uh, whatever we want to call them today, just doing their hair and eating and doing nothing else, grooming themselves all day. We see the men uh, inside their rooms playing video games all day and only coming out to eat when nobody else is around, watching porn all day. So we see what happens when we engineer societies. Basically, that's what it means. All socialistic or communistic societies are engineered. They're not natural for people. No people would ever design their cities that way. These are all social experiments done by social engineers and every time a social engineer designs a society it eventually kills the society it eventually ends up in apocalypse that's what you can expect that's what you can learn from this experiment this mouse utopia experiment is that every utopia we build ends in a nightmare it ends in destruction here's the answer leave people alone to live the way they want to live and they will always live the right way. When you design the ways for people to live, when you design quote unquote utopias, when you socially design communistic or socialistic or big apartment buildings for people, this is what happens to them. They go crazy because it's not natural. It's not normal for people. It's not normal for mice or rats or anybody. So this is why you should never trust these people who want to build a utopia. It's always lies and it always ends in destruction. That's really as simple as that. We could look to the mice utopia experiment to know that. We know what happens when these things are created and enforced. Mass insanity and then extinction. That's what we can look forward to. Michael asks, Vic, I have friends who cannot keep a clean diet, exercise, or remove their shit out of their lives. The only advice I give to them is stop doing the shit they are doing. These people want to complain to me about their lack of discipline because I have removed and am continuing to remove all the shit from my life. I don't know what to tell them. How do I handle these complainers? Here's what you do. Turn them around just a little bit so that their ass is facing you and then kick them in the ass and then walk away. Nothing else you can do with complainers. Kick them in the ass and then get out of their life. Let them wallow in their own self-pity. Let them wallow in their own shit. And you go forward. You don't want to be around people like this in your life. And it's as simple as that. You ever heard that you become who you hang around with? If you hang around with complainers, guess what's going to happen? You're going to start complaining just like them. You're even complaining to me. You understand that? You're complaining to me about your friends who complain to you. Kick them in the ass and walk away. Simple as that. Joseph asks, what are your views on Chinese herbal medicine? I think Chinese herbal medicine is good. In some cases, I think our Western allopathic medicine is good in other cases. I'm not against medicine at all times. In certain cases, medicine is appropriate. But medicine is not appropriate every single time. Sometimes you just need a herb or a spice, like the Chinese know. So the Chinese have half of the equation with their herbal medicine. The Westerners have half of the equation with their allopathic medicine. Put them together and you have real medicine. And of course, in between, you just have to understand nutrition and exercise can cure most illnesses in the world. But Chinese herbal medicine has many thousands of years of uh, study. And our, our Western medicine has maybe a hundred years of study. So they have more experience than we do. And it's very clear, it's very obvious that our medicine is killing more people than it's helping. Now it helps some people, absolutely. But does it kill people? Absolutely. I'll bet you a million dollars 
our hospitals and our doctors kill more people than any cancer, any heart disease, any diabetes, any amount of car wrecks, and any amount of suicide. Because we're playing with stuff we don't understand because we didn't study it for thousands of years like the Chinese studied their herbs for thousands of years. So that's that. The Orthodox asks, Vic, where do you draw the line between having a sense of humor and being immature? I don't draw that line. I've never drawn that line. I've never thought about it. It's not a question that I ponder. That's that. Joe asks, how do you bless your food? That's a great question. And here's the answer by Monk Mode. It's in the Monk Mode program. I'll give you a better answer to the question, why would you bless your food? The reason why you bless your food and why all people of the past, we've only recently stopped blessing our food. The reason why all people of the past bless their food is because they knew a secret. When you put good intentions into your food, that makes your food healthier. And I'll give you an example. When you eat food prepared by somebody you love, the food always tastes better than when you eat fast food prepared by somebody who's making $6 an hour and doesn't give a shit. There's a reason for that. When somebody who you love or somebody who loves you is cooking food for you, they have intentions of making the food taste good so that you will enjoy it. This is them blessing the food for you. That is what blessing the food is. It's putting good intentions into the food so that you enjoy it and you become healthy and strong and vibrant and vigorous. So people who cook food for you, who love you, their food always tastes great. People who have been married a long time say, I can't live without my wife's cooking. It's not because your wife is a, is a world-renowned chef. It's because she puts love into it. And then when you eat it, you, you extract that love from the food. So that's what blessing is, putting good intention, good energy, good positivity into the food, and then eating that. And learning to bless your food is learning to use your mental power, is learning to develop. It's just like learning meditation, actually. That's like actually what it is. And uh, I suggest you pick up monk mode to learn more about it. Martin asks, do you have an explanation for the repetitiveness of existence? I mean, why do we bang our heads against the very same questions? Like, what is the meaning of life? Where do we come from? What is truth? Why does reality feel like a prison? Ooh, that's a great question, Martin. The reason reality feels like a prison, the reason we can't answer these questions is because these questions are being kept from us. They're being hidden from us by the powers that be. You see, the powers of the world want to make money. How do you make money? Divide and conquer. You take away their natural abilities. You take away their memories. You take away their history. You take away their knowledge and then you get them fighting with each other. And this is how you, this is how the psychopaths who rule the world make money. By keeping you uninformed, by keeping you dumb, by keeping you ignorant of who you are and what you are. This is why we keep banging our head against the same questions over and over, because the answer is being hidden from us. But once you have the answer, there's no more reason to bang your head against anything. And I'll tell you one secret. When you know, when you know what the meaning of life is, when you know where we come from, when you know what the truth is, when you know why reality feels like a prison, guess what you say? You say nothing. Why? Because when you say something, people just argue with you. That's all they do. They just argue, 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 argue. So you learn to keep your mouth shut. Say, yeah, man, geez, I don't know. Don't know. Why does reality feel like a prison? I don't know. Well, the reality of why reality feels like a prison is that you are living in a prison. And uh, let me try and explain that to you. Can you go travel to a new country without having a passport? In America, can you do anything without having a license? Can you drive a car without a license from the government? Can you do anything without permission from the government? No, you can. So that's why reality feels like a prison. It is a prison. We are living in a prison. Some of us have escaped. We've escaped Shawshank. And there are certain ways and certain methods, but really it's all in the mind. It's all in the mind. The prison is your mind. And once you just unlock the key, you unlock the gates, you unlock the jail cell in your mind, you're free no matter where you live. That's essentially what monk mode is, freeing the mind so you're not limited anymore, so that even though all other people around you are still are still living in a prison, you are free. RH asks, have you read any Russian author? What are your thoughts about Russian people and their culture? The only Russian author I've read, I believe, is the fellow who wrote Lolita, but I couldn't get into the book. Way back in the day, when I was in my late teens, I had a girlfriend who was obsessed with that book, Lolita. She just loved that book, wanted me to read it. So I tried to read it, couldn't get into it. Uh, I do need to read the Gulag Archipelago, but I haven't read it. Though I do, I like the, um, how do I say this? I like the no-nonsense attitude of a lot of Russian people. So I will watch Russian people on YouTube giving speeches. A lot of Russian people understand diet. They understand, Russian people understand the absolute danger of socialism, communism, 
these type of things. So they have, they have more awareness. They have more awareness, probably because they lived through it, or some of them did, not all of them, but many of them did live through it. I've never been to Russia, but I'll tell you what, every single person I know who has been to Russia has said the same thing. They've said, I love Russia. I could live there. So I don't know. I think I might have to take a visit there and just to see. Because I've met a ton of Russians in Southeast Asia and they're a bunch of fucking jerks, boy. They're just jerks. The Russians in Southeast Asia, they've taken over the beaches everywhere in Southeast Asia. They're just a bunch of jerks. They're not nice people to be around. So anywhere, anywhere in Southeast Asia where there's a bunch of Russians, you don't want to be, for sure. But I understand that the country of Russia is far different than the groups that go to you know, Natrang or wherever. So I need to visit there, and uh, that's that. Oh, but I have been to Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and there's a big Russian community there. Russians are cold, so they're very different from American people in the sense that American people will smile at you, wave at you, say, hi, how are you? Russian people don't smile. They don't say jack shit. So it's harder to get to know them, and uh, yeah, that's that. Joseph asks, if a man must get a job for a period of time, what are the best jobs to do? Doesn't matter. Any job. Do they pay you money? do the job. Do you need a job? Are they going to pay you money? Take the job, do the job. Every single job you do is a learning experience. Now for me, all of my jobs taught me one very valuable lesson. I don't want to work these jobs anymore again for the rest of my life. So it was very important for me to work all those jobs to understand what I don't ever want to go back to and what gives me the fuel to burn this fire, to build this empire that I'm building. So all jobs I ever did, even though they were terrible, they were very important in building my character and building my awareness of what life is like if you don't get after it. If you don't develop self-sufficiency and self-mastery, what life is like is very terrible working those jobs. So if you need a job, work a job, doesn't matter what it is. Tom asks, hey, Mr. Pride, what are your thoughts about including insects to one's diet? Okay, if you would have asked me this a couple years ago, I would have made a vomit noise and said, ugh, gross. However, I, it has come to my attention and my knowledge that if, if we were living out in the forest or the woods and we couldn't catch any game animals and we were hungry, guess what we would eat? We would eat insects. And I noticed this because there's a man living in the Pacific Northwest. He goes around eating insects all the time. I saw this man on YouTube and it blew my mind because I never thought that, oh my goodness, of course we would eat insects if we were hungry. They got protein, fat, all kind of things. So I don't personally include insects in my diet because we have meat. We have access to meat. If you have access to meat, why would you bother eating insects? That being said, I have eaten insects before in both China and Thailand. They're not good, but they're not bad. And in fact, in those regions, they still eat insects. They still eat insects to this day. So if you want to include them, if you're poor, perhaps it might be a good suggestion. If you could afford meat, though, I don't understand. I don't see why you would want to include insects. Thomas asks, hey, I would like to know if there's any natural way to force the growth of hair on my face, particularly to achieve the stubble. Yeah, I'll tell you what will put hair on your face. Read Bold and Determined. Even every time I read an old Bold and Determined article, I pop a big fucking boner and grow another inch of hair on my face. So that's that. Romeo asks, hey, old St. Vic, I've been eating nothing but steak and eggs and I feel great. I've still been taking the supplements I took when I was on a matrix diet. Is this still necessary? I take vitamin D3, B complex, fish oil, magnesium, and recently started taking zinc, which made me nauseous. Well, if it made you nauseous, you probably don't need it. Zinc can be found in meat, so you wouldn't need to take zinc. D3 is found in the sunlight. So if you don't get enough sunlight, then go ahead and take D3. B complex, it depends on what you are eating. It depends on where you get your meat from. Because if you're eating grocery store meat, it's probably going to be low in the B vitamins. And uh, then I would see how you feel is, is the real answer. How do you feel? Why are you asking my permission to take vitamins? Take it and see how you feel. Regarding fish oil, fish oil is good. It's great if you eat fish, specifically fish, fatty fish like salmon, mackerel. But if you don't, then go ahead and take fish oil because it's really good for your joints. Magnesium, it just depends. Take these things, see how you feel, and then stop taking them and see how you feel. And that's how you know if you need them or you don't need them. Zebra asks, since starting the carnivore diet, I only sleep five to six hours per night. I generally wake up semi-rested but still have a rough midday crash. I avoid light and meals near bedtime, black out the room, etc. Is there any other way to increase the deepness and duration of my sleep? Are you drinking coffee? If you're drinking coffee, stop drinking coffee. Coffee messes with your sleep. And if you're having a midday crash, here's what I would suggest. I would suggest that you are fairly new to the carnivore diet and you're fairly new to kicking carbohydrates out of your diet. Your body is recovering right now, so just get through it and you will get better. You will reach a point on the carnivore diet 
where the thought of taking a nap doesn't even occur to you. The thought of taking a nap in midday to me is crazy. It wouldn't even cross my mind. However, when I first cut out the carbohydrates for good, yeah, I would get a midday crash, feel a little bit tired. But now these days I have constant energy all the time. So simply get through the withdrawal period. Get through the carbohydrate withdrawal period and you're going to have crazy constant energy all the time. Julian asks, five years ago, my little brother was 16 and very fat. Now he has an above average physique. He still cannot get a girlfriend. He is lacking self-esteem and it's like he is still that unconfident fat teenager in an alpha male's body. How can he train his mind and character to become confident around girls? Tell him to go into monk mode. Monk mode is the mental training program that will give you the confidence, the self-sufficiency to do anything in this life. I stand by that fact. I stand by that. I guarantee that. Also get his ass on 30 days of discipline. Every young man needs to have done 30 days of discipline for at least 30 days. And how can he develop confidence and self-esteem? Read Bold and Determined. It's really so simple. It's right in front of your fucking face all the time. Read the words that I've given you for eight years and then put them into practice and then tell other people to read them. It's really, really very simple. So you see, friends, I told you before, I'm having a real hard time answering these questions in a polite manner. I just want to rip your fucking head off for asking me questions that have an obvious answer. I've been telling you for years, get after it. Just do it. Be a man. Stop being a boy. If you want to do something like be confident around girls, here's what you do. Go talk to girls. Go say hi to them right now. Turn off this podcast. Go somewhere where some girls are. Walk up to one and say, hi, how you doing? Joda Walter asks, Uncle Vic, you've sold me on the all meat diet. My question is, will you ever do a post on what you eat, how you prepare it, and what you add to it, pictures of the meat, butter, etc.? Yeah, that's a good question. I think I probably will do that in the, in the future at some time. I know people enjoy that kind of thing. But what I eat is very, very simple. On a lot of days, all I eat is... Some steak, some liver, some eggs. But uh, yeah, I'll show you some pictures of that in the future. Absolutely. MD asks, Hi Vic, I've tried Red Monkey and Carnivore Diet, but I have trouble relaxing. What is the best CBD oil to try? Is there one at Red Supplements? I don't know what the best CBD oil to try is. I don't use CBD. Now, somebody did send me a free bottle of CBD. I can't find the damn thing, so I wasn't able to try it yet. I don't know where I put it. When I find it, I'll try it. And I'll let you know how it works. Regarding relaxing, it's all in the mind. It's all in the mind. If you can't relax, it's very, very, it's very probable that you're drinking coffee or you're spending too much time on the internet or too much time on your phone. These things destroy your relaxation. Throw the fucking phone away, close the computer, stop drinking coffee, go for a hike, go for a nice long hour or two hour hike in the wilderness, come home, you'll be relaxed. It's really, really very simple to relax. Cut away all of the things that make you not relaxed and then go somewhere where you can be alone in solitude, and you will relax. You're not relaxed because you're not in solitude. You understand that? You have all these outside influences bzz, 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 buzzing around you, causing you to not relax. So get rid of those fucking things and go relax. Roy asks, Hey, Unc, I've been on steak and eggs for close to a month now, and I'm seeing autoimmune issues I've had for years clear up. That is the magic of this diet that I'm talking about, friends. All of your health issues that you thought you had, they go away. The ones you thought were going to last you forever, they go away. You know why? It was the food doing it to you in the first place. Roy goes on to say, he's fucking pumped about that. Funny question for the next podcast. What do you do with the unchewable parts of your steak? You know, the last bit that makes your jaw cramp and your teeth hurt. Haha. <laughs> well, I chew them until I can't chew them anymore and I spit them out. Sometimes I try and swallow them, but to be perfectly honest, I usually just spit them out. If there's some dogs around, I just spit them out and give them to the dogs. Steve asks, when is Discipline Boot Camp, 30 Days of Business, Martial Arts, and Self-Mastery at a Muay Thai gym on the islands of Thailand? We should make this an annual event. It doesn't have to be perfect the first time. Ooh, that's a fun idea. I would love to do some sort of events for you guys. I don't necessarily know that it's going to involve Muay Thai on the islands of Thailand, but I would like to start doing some events for you. So if you have some ideas for events that you would like to see Bold and Determined put on for you, let me know and I will consider all of them because I want to do more. You can hear it in my voice. I've got so much energy these days, but I want to do more. And even though I want to rip your head off when you ask me questions, I still want to give you the answers. All right. I'll be off red growth soon. I'll be back to my normal, uh, pleasant Yoda self where I can answer all your questions. So let me know. What do you, what kind of events you want to see? You let me know. Enough people let me know. I will make it happen. 
Guaranteed. Drew asks, what are your thoughts on high IGF-1 in relation to the carnivore diet? Apparently, high IGF-1 can lead to a higher risk of cancer at a shorter lifespan. Oh. Here's what I think about high IGF-1 on a carnivore diet leading to a higher risk of cancer in a shorter lifespan. Here's what I think. Listen. That's what I think about it. Everything you tell me about the carnivore diet killing you early is a lie. A lie made by stupid people who don't know what the fuck they're talking about. So there's my answer. Every time you tell me that the natural human diet gives you cancer, here's what I think. <coughs> fuck off. Rav asks, Please correct me if I'm misquoting you, but you said recently that you avoid meditation since it is unproductive and leads to detachment and being content with doing nothing. Do you think a form of meditation where you sit down and apply a hyper-focused mindset to achieving your goals would still have benefit? I have told you in the past that meditation is garbage and does nothing for you. I've also got to tell you that in monk mode, there is a meditation program that will do a lot for you. So it might make me a hypocrite, but it doesn't make me wrong. Some meditation is good. Some meditation is bad. The meditation I've laid out for you in the monk mode program, program is very good for developing your mind and your imagination and your willpower. The meditation these people do at LA Fitness on a Friday night with the 300 girls in yoga class with their smiling on the ground is fake. It's not going to do anything for you. So some meditation is good and I show you how to do the right meditation to develop your concentration. And that's what meditation should be about is about developing your concentration so that you can create your businesses in your mind first before you create them in the real life. That's what meditation should be. Raymer asks, hey Vic, wanted to get your thoughts on having a castle for you and your family and friends. There are some very beautiful castles available in Europe because many of our great castles from the past have been abandoned. You can get them for a great price. Thoughts on getting a castle? It sounds great in theory, but in reality, you need a bunch of people living in a castle. Otherwise, it's going to be lonely as hell. I've lived in great big houses and small houses. I've been way happier living in small houses than in great big houses. So I don't see the need for, uh, even though it would be cool, no question, to own a castle. But I wouldn't want to live in one because it would just be lonely. And that's really as simple as that. When you have just a few people, the smaller the place is, the happier you are. It sounds crazy. It sounds like, oh, oh, you need more rooms for everybody in a bigger house and you become way happier. That's not true. That's never been true. In fact, even living in a poor area has always made me happier. The cheaper my place is and the smaller it is, the happier I've been. I've been by far the happiest in my cheapest and smallest apartments and in the big houses, been miserable. So that's that. Tony asks, hey, Victor, how can I become mentally stronger and less sensitive? Ooh, get on monk mode. Monk mode will force you to become mentally stronger and less sensitive. That's the way it's designed. That's what happens. Get on monk mode. Do it for 30 days. Come back after 30 days and tell me what happened. Did you become mentally stronger, less sensitive? Can almost guarantee you that you did. ML asks, how was coming off of testosterone replacement therapy? How long till natural production was fully restored? If you're on TRT for a number of years, your natural production is never going to go back to what it was before. You just have to understand that. And you have to find ways to manipulate your hormones so that you have the best bang for your buck. That includes things like eating saturated fat and cholesterol. That includes cycling things like red beast and red growth. And that's that. You're never going to be as, you're never going to be like you were before if you were on for a long time. So I just live with it. I just deal with it. I force myself to do things. Even though I have lower testosterone than when I was on TRT, TRT actually is not that great. You don't actually have super high levels of testosterone on TRT because TRT also produces estrogen. So that's one thing that happens if you don't pay very close and careful attention to your estrogen. It gets out of control. Your testosterone plummets and your estrogen plummets. So a lot of these guys you see on the gym they have these big, fat, bulky, bloated physiques. It's because they're on testosterone. They don't know how to control their estrogen and their estrogen is out of control. So for me, for the bang for my buck, testosterone has never been the best way to increase testosterone. Other stuff for me has always been better. Red PCT was one of the best. We had to we had to revamp it, and uh, Red PCT 2.0 is also very good. Red Beast is good. Red Growth is good. And for me, for the bang for my buck, I like stuff that doesn't give you estrogenic side effects, and testosterone does. Struggling with porn asks, why is it so hard to quit porn? I can't resist it. It wouldn't be a problem if it didn't make me feel shame and shyness. The way, the reason that it is so hard to quit porn is because it is a drug. It gives you hits of dopamine. It gives you new variety and new hits of dopamine. I've got an entire chapter about this in monk mode. So just go buy monk mode and read it. 
and it will show you a why it's so hard to quit porn and b how to quit it big ds vic what you what is your take on the law of attraction okay the law of attraction is not like a real law like if you break the law of attraction you're going to go to jail but the law of attraction is like you've got two magnets right one is a positive and one is a negative the positive and the negative attract each other but when you have a positive and a positive they repel each other so let me give you an example a male and a female a, a female who acts feminine and a male who acts masculine will attract each other but a female who acts masculine and then a male who acts masculine will repel each other which is why i hate feminists because they don't act feminine they act like here's what feminists actually are they're masculinists they hate everything feminine and want to be like men they want to be women who are men that's why they're disgusting and repellent to me because i'm a real man and they're not real ladies they're not real women so they're disgusting to me and they, re they repel me but when I see real ladies, real girls in a dress with a smile and not trying to compete with me, but trying to compliment me, ooh, I'm attracted. So that's the law of attraction. It's real, of course. What you get, you give. So if you are a real man, you will attract real women. If you are a man of success, you will attract wealth. If you go through the monk mode program, you will magnetize yourself. You will give yourself an animal magnetism where you will attract the right females, the right business opportunities, destiny and fate and money. All these things can be created if you first develop yourself, your mind and your body. If you develop yourself to the way that you need to be, try to develop self-mastery. You develop this animal magnetism where everything, everything good is just attracted to you. And that's what success is. Become making yourself so attractive that money and women and success just come to you like you're a magnet for success. Black Mar asks, Mr. Vic, what would your advice about self-development for paraplegics and people with disabilities? Have you ever thought about producing materials, blog posts, and other projects specifically designed for people with mental and physical disabilities? That's a great question. The answer is yes, I have thought about it because I know somebody who is disabled. But the reality is, the stone cold reality is that the advice I give to able-bodied people applies to people who are not able-bodied because all the advice is mental. It starts in your mind. Everything is in the mind and you have to accept responsibility first before you can do anything else. And a lot of disabled people are like regular people and they refuse to accept responsibility. And if you refuse to accept responsibility, nothing can be done for you. Any change you want to make in your life starts with you. You must make the change. It doesn't matter if you're missing a leg or missing an arm or sitting in a wheelchair or if you're able-bodied. It all starts in your mind. You have to make the decision. You have to decide to get better, to get well, to get after it. And if you don't decide to do it, there is nobody else in the world who can help you do it. So I have thought about writing articles for disabled people, but I don't see the need for the very specific reason is that the advice that I give works the same for all people in the world. And if you're not willing to listen to the advice because you're missing a leg, then that's that. There's nothing else I can do for you. But if you take the advice, it doesn't matter if you're in a wheelchair or able-bodied. If you take the advice laid out on B&D, in the podcast and in the blog, great things will happen for you. But if you don't take the advice, if you don't take self-responsibility, if you don't try to achieve self-mastery, you'll get what you've always gotten. Marcus asks, is it possible to get a six-pack on the carnivore diet and doing body of a Spartan? What specifically do you need to change, if anything, from diet or your workout? It is absolutely possible to get a six-pack on the carnivore diet and body of a Spartan. Here's how you do it. Eat two meals a day. No more. Eat two meals a day. Don't snack. If after one month you are not losing the amount of fat that you want to lose, cut that meal down to one meal a day. Do that for 30 days. If you're not losing the amount of fat that you want to lose after 30 days, go to one meal every other day. This sounds like it's so hard and so difficult. And ooh, boo, 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 boo. guess what? Having a six pack is hard and difficult. But actually, it's quite easy to skip your meals. When you're on the carnivore diet, you stop getting hungry. You just stop getting hungry. So it's very easy to eat two meals. Two meals a day is a luxury on the carnivore diet. One meal a day is super easy. So that's what you do. If you're not burning the fat you want to burn, stop eating so much food. The answer has always been the same. If you want to burn fat, eat less food. It's really very simple. Alex asks, Vic, what advice would you give to a young buck in terms of finances? Make a lot of money. That's the number one advice for young bucks about finances. Make a lot of money. So many people with so many young bucks with no money want to ask me what to do. 
what they should what what they should invest in what what kind of stocks they should be in what kind of 401k they should get in and they don't have any money in the first place here's what you've got to do make the money in the first place set your motherfucking mind to making money then when you have money you can cross that bridge when you come to it steven asks i bought red pct and red beast and i would like to know if i can take both in the same day absolutely you can you're going to get crazy good results if you do red beast is going to jack up your testosterone red pct is going to kill your estrogen you're going to be a mean lean spartan machine jack asks how do you make money on the bnd blog the content is free and i don't see much advertising how does it generate revenue for you that's a great question. I wrote the entire answer in a book called Spartan Entrepreneur Blog Artist. Buy it, read it, and you'll learn the answer. Narenta asks, do you recommend ground beef for the time being as a remedy to the adaptation to the carnivore diet? Yeah, ground beef is fine. Ground beef is good. I eat ground beef fairly frequently. I like to grill up some burgers and the ground beef. I don't eat ground beef raw. I don't like raw ground beef, but I do like cooked ground beef. So ground beef is great. Absolutely. If you're having a difficult time uh, getting enough food in, then absolutely get some ground beef. However, there's one problem with ground beef is that it can usually be quite lean. So you want to add some kind of fat to it, uh, put some cheese on it, eat some butter with it, anything you can do to add fat to it. Because sometimes it's just too lean and meat that is too lean is not going to help you adapt to the carnivore diet. Joseph asks, my granddad has just been diagnosed with colon cancer. What steps could he take to become healthy again? The doctor, of course, said that he will need chemotherapy. He believes in me and will take my advice. Also, what is your views on the causes of cancers and modern treatments such as chemotherapy? Here's what I think. This is my opinion. I'm not a doctor. Don't take my medical advice. This is my personal advice to myself and to nobody else. I don't believe people really die of cancer. I believe they die of chemotherapy. And if you look at the people who, uh, if you look at a lot of the people who survived cancer, they did it because they didn't go through chemotherapy or they canceled the chemotherapy early. I've seen people die of cancer. Well, I've seen people die of chemotherapy. Let me put it that way. Now, my, here's what I would do. If I had colon cancer, here's what I would do. I would fast. I would stop eating. I would let the body heal itself. I would personally never get chemotherapy because I know what happens to people who get on chemotherapy. They die in a horrible way. And the hospital makes a ton of money. So what I would do, I would fast. I would stop eating. I would literally stop eating until I was well. And then when I was well, I would eat nothing but meats. I would eat no more vegetables, no more fruits, no more grains, none of that bullshit. I would fast. Then I would eat the the carnivore diet. That's what I would do. That's not medical advice. I'm not telling your grandfather what to do. Let him get chemotherapy if you want. Let him him eat, eat the broccoli that is rotting in his colon, giving him colon cancer. But for me personally, what I would do if I had colon cancer, I would fast. And then I would eat the carnivore diet. Simple as that. Michael Lass, Christianity is said to have incorporated paganism. Is Orthodox Christianity our best link to the past? That's pretty funny, Michael. That's pretty funny. Orthodox Christianity is a wall between us and the past. It is a wall between us and our ancestors. It is a wall between us and who we are. And it exists to keep you ignorant. It does not exist to, to uh, help you know who you are. So I'm talking from an American point of view. I know that in, say, Russia, they have Orthodox Christianity. I know that in uh, Georgia, they have the Georgian Orthodox Church. All these Orthodox churches, I don't have any experience with those because I'm an American. In American Christianity, we don't have any relation to the past. We don't have any link to the past whatsoever. So that's that. Trevor asks, I've got depression after reading The Manipulated Man and Shadow Men. I cannot see the point of my life if everything is stacked against me in such an overwhelming way. Oh my goodness, let me cry for you, Trevor. What is the point if you can't find a decent human being that isn't conditioned to either hate you or dry you up or both? What is the point if you were born in a poor family that made it still makes poor choices that made your life miserable? Jesus Christ, you fucking crybaby. Get a grip. Your life is whatever you make it. You understand that, you fucking faggot? Your life is what you make it. You can make it good, or you can be a little whiny bitch like you're being, and you can make it bad. Not everybody is against you, you dumb fuck. Those are books, not reality. Just because a woman wrote in The Manipulated Man that every woman is trying to rob you and take everything from you doesn't mean it's true, you dumb fuck. It means that's her opinion. You understand that? It's what she said. There are many great people in this world, but if you haven't... Uh, a faggoty attitude like this, you're never going to find them. You're only going to find the people that want to take advantage of you if you act like this. Develop yourself. 
master yourself, and you will attract all of the good things in your life. But if you keep this faggoty, pathetic attitude, you're only going to attract the worst things in life. Simple as that. Nick Haygood asks, can you share with us your understanding of the Kali Yuga and the various cycles in the universe? These types of macro cycles fascinate me. It's almost like humanity is stuck in a loop inside some code. I wonder if we'll ever break out. Great question. Here's the answer. We will never break out because everything has always been the same and everything will always be the same. We go in cycles. Winter is always the same in winter. Summer is always the same in summer. The Kali Yuga is the, is the winter of the cosmic cycle. It's the end of the cosmic cycle, but the end is also the beginning. So even though these are the darkest times, guess what happens after the darkest times? The light comes out. The light shines through. So we are stuck in a loop. Everything is exactly the same as it always was. Evolution is a joke. It's not real. We didn't come from a primordial swamp and then a rock developed into a fish and then the fish developed into a, a whatever. People have always been this way. There's never been a time where we were anything different than what we are right now. Of course, we're doing unnatural things right now, eating unnatural food. Uh, we've got unnatural technology and so forth. But human nature has always been the same and will always be the same. So there's no reason to cry like the fellow before who's crying about the way the world is. The world has always been the same and it's up to you to make a change. And if you aren't smart enough, if you aren't clever enough, if you aren't resourceful enough, if you aren't strong enough to do it, Guess what? You don't deserve anything good in this world. But if you have the nuts in the guts to go after what you want, you will get it. So it doesn't matter if this is the dark night of the soul. It doesn't matter if we are in the cosmic winter. It doesn't matter if this is the dark ages. It doesn't matter if this is the worst time in the world or the best. It's always been the same. The prison is mental. And you can break out of the prison by developing self-mastery, self-sufficiency, regardless of the time or the age. Marcus the Wolf asks, how does a natural man live in an unnatural world? Ooh, what a wonderful, fantastic question. Got a lot to say about this. What do you say we answer this question in the next episode of the Bold and Determined Podcast? Until next time, friends, have a nice day.